Good evening. My name is Amy. I'm a Community Education Coordinator for Boulder Community Health. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture, talking to your doctor about end-of-life care. The format for tonight's lecture will be, uh, the lecture portion will last for about 45 minutes. Afterwards, we'll use the remaining time for questions. Please type your short, general question in the chat box to the right of your screen, and we will do our best, if Tom allows, to get to each one. Now, on behalf of Boulder Community Health, I'd like to introduce tonight's speakers. <coughs> Dr. Jean Abbott is a member of BCH's Ethics Committee and a co-founder of the Conversation Project, which encourages people to talk to their doctors and loved ones about what is important to them as they near the end of their lives. Dr. Abbott is also board certified <coughs> pardon me, in emergency medicine and a faculty member at the Center of, for Bioethics and Humanities at CU Anschutz. Her current work focuses on ethics consultation, palliative care, and end-of-life issues. Dr. Benjamin Kaiden is the Chief Medical Officer for Boulder Community Health. He was trained in palliative care at Harvard Medical School and more recently has worked to educate primary care prov providers at BCH on having advanced care planning conversations with patients. He also collaborated on the development of an advanced provider communication training program at BCH, which was started in 2017. Welcome to Drs. Abbott and Kaiden. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, this virtual uh, lecture format is, is new for us. So uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks, Jean. Uh, I feel very <laughs> lucky to have the support and uh, guidance of Jean, who's really uh, a national expert on this topic. So I'll try to defer to her as much as possible. Um, so I think we'll start with the, um, the first slide just to talk about our objectives. And I think the simple objective is just to encourage you um, to feel empowered to have these conversations uh, both with your family and your loved ones, and also with your healthcare providers and, um, and uh, primary care physician. Um, well, we're working out the, the issues on this, in case you didn't guess. <laughs> so, um, some you know, very simple objective, objectives. If you have not already, and I suspect many of you have, uh, decide who would, who would be the best person to speak uh, for you, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, how you might make that decision. Um, uh, you can see we have our, our, uh, our little nudge here, which is we would, we would really like to know what your wishes are and um, any way we can encourage you to make that clear um, in, in your own mind and also to share it with us is a, is a true goal of ours. And um, to help you uh, navigate how to discuss this with your primary care physician or any physician or uh, healthcare provider, um, that you're interacting with. And finally, um, a, a, a goal is for us to document that um, conversation and decisions so that um, we uh, continue to know what your wishes are and as they change, we can update them and um, adjust. So, um, last time we did this, Ben, we did pretty much the same talk, but we had a big audience in front of us, and we asked how many people have a medical decision maker, and um, more crucially, I think, is does that person know that they are your decision maker? To me, it's stunning how many of us have written it down, or have it at least in our mind, but haven't yet talked to that person. Um, and then, the next question for all of you, and you get to raise your hand in your virtual wherever you are, have you talked to your doctor about your end of life wishes? And a little bit later in the hour, we're gonna talk a little about how COVID-19 has impacted the way that you may be thinking about advanced care planning. And think of other pressing questions that you might have. As Amy said, she's going to be uh, monitoring the chat column and uh, hopefully we'll get to some of your questions. All right, a couple of facts to start us off. One is that over half of us will not be able to participate in decisions near the end of our lives. And here's a pop question for you, Ben. If 
in Colorado, if you haven't designated, I hope you have an MDPOA form, um, if you don't designate somebody as your agent with your MDPOA, who makes decisions for you um, if you can't make them for yourself? Well, obviously it's my wife, right, Jean? Uh, yeah, eh, that's, <laughs> the th that's what almost everybody thinks. But even you, Ben, who may go mountain biking and hit your head on a rock or ski into a ski well, needs to have decided who is gonna speak for you because in Colorado we have a very weird state with a very interesting law. And that law says, uh-uh, there is not a hierarchy. It's not your spouse. It's not your eldest child who speaks for you if you can't. And in fact, if you haven't designated somebody and put it down in writing and hopefully told Ben and the office crew um, in your doctor's office, it turns out that we are obligated, Ben and I, as providers, to gather people who care about you. That can be your spouse, your kids, uh, your parents, if you're younger, or close friends. And they sit among themselves, we convene them, and they decide who best can speak for you, who knows your wishes best. Now this law is peculiar, but it's a very cool one, I think, Ben, because it was started in the 1980s during the time when HIV, the HIV epidemic was just starting. And there were a lot of people, it turns out, who might have been estranged from their family or might have had a same-sex partner who wasn't legally recognized at that time. And everybody has an equal voice at the table. It does make for some good ethics consults because you can imagine not every family or circle is very kumbaya-ish, but um, it's, a, it's a very cool law. But it does mean that if you assume it's your spouse, um, you could be in trouble or I could be in trouble when you end up in the ICU. So who should you choose? Um, first off, somebody who knows what matters to you. Secondly, someone who is okay with speaking to the medical team. That's not exactly an easy thing sometime, for some people. It can be intimidating. So you want somebody who's sort of bold and able to, to speak in your voice and somebody who can speak to your interests, not their own, um, as well as somebody who is not trekking for six months in Peru and unavailable by cell phone. So. Um, it can be very interesting to see who people decide. You probably get into this conversation a little bit in the office too. Now I have my husband as my first decision maker, but I have two kids, one of whom is pretty left-brained and would not have problems, as much problem, making decisions near the end of my life, but one of whom is an artist who, it would be hard for him to make those kinds of decisions. Um, I've seen some people who have five kids who throw up their hands and say, you know what, they would fight about this the whole time. I'm going to choose my high school best friend to make decisions for me if I can't. So why do you need this person? Well, it's, this is a fun little study from the New York Times. Um, we all think that we're going to die abruptly. Here is a graph, a survey that they did of people saying, how do you want your life to end? And those first three parts of that add up to about 88% of the population that they surveyed, and they all want to die quickly. I think lots of people think, I'd like it to be in my sleep, or I'd like to be abruptly. Um, the problem is only 10% of us these days die in an abrupt fashion. Now, I will point out this graph is sort of fun because three of us, three percent of us don't think we're going to die. I think we think we're immortal. And I do like the one percent who think that they would like to be shot by a jealous spouse. Um, but that's the New York Times. So here is the trajectory of the ways different kinds of time courses for people um, these days. So here's sudden death. Again, 100 years ago, most people died of a relatively sudden death from infection, trauma, childbirth. Um, but nowadays, it's only about 10% of us. Another 30% die in a trajectory of terminal cancer. Not cancer itself, but cancer at the end of life. And that's the basis for the hospice 
program. We won't talk about that today. Then I think you see people in this lower um, two trajectories, 30% each. Tell us a little about those. Yeah, Gene, as an internist who works in the hospital and the, and the outpatient setting, I think this is sort of the bread and butter of what we do. Um, and what, what we see is uh, the organ failure graph is, uh, let's say, someone with chronic lung disease or heart disease um, or sometimes multiple chronic diseases. And you can see it's sort of a stuttering illness with a decline, followed by some improvement, followed by more decline. And, and the timing can be variable. It's typically prolonged. And, um, and then the frailty on the, the far side is often um, people who have dementia or sometimes just uh, old age and um, other forms of frailty where it becomes harder to walk and be mobile. And, um, and these are actually, as Jean has pointed out, much more common um, and certainly in my practice, the majority of what we see and really, I think, a different uh, end-of-life pathway than the top two, which we certainly see in the trauma environment and uh, cardiac disease, et cetera, um, which is why it's probably more important for us uh, younger folks to think about this as well. Um, but they're not as common as the lower uh, part of the slide. Go ahead, Ben. So... Um, you know, I think that if you haven't read Atul Gawande's work, he's a, he's a really great author, and he's explored um, end of life pretty, um, pretty profoundly in the book Being Mortal, which I enjoyed a lot, and I'd recommend you consider. Um, and he talks a little bit about how medicine's technological failure to, um, to, to really address this issue, and I think his, one of his main points is we focus on solving problems, problems that we are able to solve, that there's some you know, fancy uh, surgical treatment or robotic device or um, medication, but we, we really don't like to address, and I think this is patients and healthcare providers, we have a harder time addressing the sort of unsolvable problems like frailty, chronic diseases that are incurable. And so I think it's kind of natural for both patients and doctors to avoid it. And, you know, I think that's natural but there's some downsides to, to avoiding it, which I think we'll, we'll explore a little bit more. Yeah, um, we, the, the other point that um, at the bottom of the slide is we focus a lot on safety, but often safety is in conflict with comfort or quality. And so depending on the situation, sometimes we have to balance uh, both. You know, for example, somebody who is chronically uh, aspirating or swallowing their food and getting pneumonia uh, and the, should we not have them eat? And, you know, how does that feel to not eat? Um, do we put feeding tubes in and things like that? So we, over the years, we've really wrestled with these problems. And historically, I think we're getting a lot better. We focused on safety over comfort. Yeah, I uh, had the honor of trying pureed foods when my mother-in-law was very late-stage dementia. Um, I wouldn't wish that on anyone, yeah. you know. Right. <laughs> but that's one of the sort of safety values that I think we all have. We don't want people to aspirate. Um, and we think that surviving quantity is more important than quality. And I think most people, now that we're starting to see these new trajectories of end of life, understand that sometimes quality is more important than quantity. So, Ben? Um, yeah, I think, I think this gets back to one of the, the first things you said, Gene, which is what's important to you? What matters to you? That's kind of the fundamental question that I think as healthcare providers we want to know. And I think we don't always do a very good job of asking that question or maybe we don't even listen to the answer. And then sometimes we listen to it and we, somehow it gets lost in the shuffle and it doesn't end up in your chart and then you have to have the conversation again. So we're gonna kind of keep coming back to the fundamental question is what matters to you? Um, and I think we've talked a little bit about this. We don't wanna give the impression that we have a side on this. Uh, if your preference is to live a long life uh, and comfort is less important, that's helpful to know. If your preference is you'd rather not uh, suffer and you would rather uh, your life be potentially shorter but you don't suffer, we want to know that too. 
And um, we don't want you to feel reluctant to tell us either way because really the decision is not ours to make. Um, it, it, it's, it's one of those things that we, we sort of avoid talking about and then we don't know. We have this black box of, and I, I think the interesting thing is, uh, Gene, you also talked about making sure telling your family member what you want and I often ask people, well, who's your power of attorney? And they say, oh, it's my brother or my wife or whatever. And then I say, well, do they know? And so it's not unusual for people to say, no, they don't know, but you know, of course they are. And I say, well, have you ever talked to them about what you would want? <laughs> and they say, well, not, you know, maybe five years ago, or, and we're gonna talk about how things change over time. But um, one of the real values in designating your medical power of attorney, I think you have to go beyond that. It's having the conversation, and, and one of the reasons that that is so important is, no matter what your decision is, if you can relieve your loved one from having to make a decision that they don't really know what your answer would be, they often feel guilty one way or the other, and it creates uh, moral distress or uh, discomfort. If they know for sure, mom told me repeatedly she never wanted to be on a ventilator, it's a pretty easy decision when it comes to a time where you have to talk about whether she should be on a ventilator. And then um, as the doctor, I try to advise, what would your mom want? What did she say? It sounds like she made a decision and I try to take that off the loved one because um, I think that can create trauma. Yeah, and now see, I'm an older generation than you, Ben. And we never got this training in medical school. We never learned to have these conversations. You're, you're already explaining it much better than many of the docs from my generation. And the reason that this is important is because we live in a very diverse society. So here's a sort of a fun graph. The Economist actually took some uh, research that was done in JAMA and made it really pretty. Um, and this is a little bit hard to read, but the lesson here is what is an acceptable life varies a whole lot between people. And so this graph down the middle says these conditions would be about the same as death for me. So half of people think that if they were incontinent, it would be worse than death. And half of people think that would be okay. This was actually asked of elderly people with significant chronic disease. So this wasn't your hypothetical 24-year-old. If you had to live on a breathing machine, a ventilator, half of people said, no way, that would be worse than death for me. But half of people said, you know, that would be okay. Down to being in a wheelchair, very few people would say, that's worse than death. Most people would say, I think I could adapt to that. But not only are we different as individuals, but interestingly enough, our priorities and what is worth living changes for each of us over the course of time, too, which is quite fascinating. All right. All right, Ben. So what kinds of written advanced directives are there? Well, the, the, the bottom line is there's quite a few. We're gonna go over some of the main ones. There's a CPR directive, that is, do you want cardiopulmonary resuscitation in the event that your heart stops or you stop breathing? Most of us are familiar with that. I think uh, in the movies or on TV, I think uh, <laughs> that always works, right? I mean, CPR, is, it's wonderful, and, it, and, and I do not mean to diminish CPR. It's a very life-saving technique but it only works generally in certain situations and in other situations, for example, chronically ill, frail, hospitalized patients, CPR success is actually much lower than I think lay people often think. Um, you might down know the percentage. Down in the single digits yeah, probably. Yeah, somewhere right. under 10%. <laughs> I would guess actually quite a bit under 10%. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I, it, it it gets lower percentages based on your health status. Uh, living will is um, a, a document that's a little bit more specific, outlining what you would want, and um, it goes into some, some more detail. The Medical Dura Power of Attorney, MDPOA, the stars are there because that's where we are focusing. We think that that's where the money is. That's the sort of easiest and most flexible, and it makes this the most sense. And what that is is deciding who your decision maker is and then giving them guidance about what matters to you and what your goals are. Because as Gene said, um, situations change, and so right now incontinence might be totally intolerable to me, 
But then I might become incontinent and be like, eh, you know, I can handle this. It's, it's not great, but I don't want to die because of my incontinence. And I think things change over time. And so medical durable power of attorneys give your decision maker a little bit more leeway to make decisions for you. And uh, the most form we're not going to talk much about, but that's really for advanced terminal illness where you're expected to live less than six months. And it's a more specific uh, a measure that um, certainly we, we do at BCH and are happy to discuss if there's questions. So I got into this business, sort of the back door, by doing ethics consults um, and seeing what happens when people haven't thought about what their advanced directives are. They haven't assigned somebody who's their medical power of attorney. So I see people who haven't had directives completed, I see people, the family clustered in the intensive care unit saying, well, I'm not sure what she would want. We never talked about this. I see family who say, you mean I'm supposed to be, like you said, Ben, I'm supposed to be her medical durable power of attorney? We, we never talked about this. And then because of our interesting law, we see family members who disagree. Um, one knows exactly what mom wants, and the other one knows exactly what mom wants, but the problem is they disagree completely. The other thing, and one of the challenges and reasons for conversations is, even if you put everything down in the check boxes in your advanced directives, it's hard sometimes to interpret those in light of a situation that you might find yourself. You may predict that you're going to have a stroke, and then you have a heart attack, or in this particular time, you get COVID-19, and lo and behold, you're in respiratory failure when you thought, oh, I'm probably going to have a heart attack or a stroke. So go ahead, Ben. Well, I was just going to interject. I, th I think uh, one thing I used to see in the hospital a lot is these, I think it's in the living will where it often defaults to after 14 days on a ventilator, that's a, that's a trial that people want, and they don't want to go longer than that. But in reality, if you really are terminal in the ICU and you're dying and it's obvious, often I think family members realize that's not really what the person wanted. They wanted up to 14 days if they thought they had a chance to live or they thought this was reversible or they could bounce back, but they didn't want 14 days to then die on day 15. Uh, and so sometimes you put yourself in a little bit of a box when you when you... Uh, try to dictate all these details because it, it's hard to imagine all the possibility. Like, I, do I want dialysis? Well, well maybe in certain situations. Um, and, and it's very difficult, even for someone who's trained as a doctor, to even imagine all those circumstances. So for someone with less experience, I just I, I, that's why I think I'm troubled by these 14 days or 10 days or 20 days. And so I use the words with patients when I talk about it. Um, would you like a trial on a ventilator if you felt like you had a chance of recovery? That's and a they good say way yes of or, Yes or yeah, no. Yeah. And then, and then that, that way your medical team can make a determination and counsel your, your medical power of attorney and say, I think there's a pretty good chance of recovery, and they can discuss what that means, and you can get other opinions, and you can make a decision. And um, I, I find that to be more helpful. And that circles back to your point, which is that you should let your agent, who has your MDPOA, have some leeway. And you can write that in on the MDPOA form. I'd like my agent to be able to make decisions across the table from my doctor that are in my best interest, knowing what my values are and what makes life meaningful and what it matters to me, not necessarily the checkboxes or the numbers, as you point out, that I put in my advanced directives. They're good practice, but they often, they sometimes tie us up. So my, the last point that I've seen in ethics consults is this one about prior wishes that you've written down that may be different from best interests. So maybe in the abstract you wrote something down five years ago and it, it's just not in your best interest right now. In fact, I've seen people who said, I want you to try everything when they roll into the ICU and two weeks later, when all of their systems are failing, you go, we're not in the same place right now. Um, are you sure your loved one would really want that? And, and so it, it can be a struggle. The most important thing is that your agent, who's speaking for you, knows what makes life meaningful. Gina, I wonder how often you see uh, someone come in with an advanced directive 
that hasn't been updated for 10 or 15 years, and now they have uh, totally, and you know, maybe they've been chronically ill or they've gotten some, and does You're that right. come up often? Oh yeah, so what we usually recommend for people, and I'm sure you do in your office too, is that on anniversaries or when you have a change in your health status, you go pull them out and take a look. And in fact, you better go look at who your MDPOA is. I did a community presentation a little while ago, and. There was a lovely old lady in it who said, oh, sweetie, I've chosen my MDPOA. It's all taken care of. And then she sort of stopped and she said, wait a minute, my sister's 88 right now. Maybe I need to rethink this. <laughs> so <laughs> You certainly don't want your ex-wife to be your decision maker. Well, maybe you do. But <laughs> maybe you do, right. <laughs> it depends. So the forms can be useful, but you need more than forms. I think that's what we're preaching right now. We aren't good at predicting what we might want in the abstract future. Um, we adapt often more than we think we will. I know that 20 years ago that if I couldn't climb 14ers, gosh, life wouldn't have been <laughs> worth living. But right now, walking on the Mesa Trail with my dog is joyful, you know, even if I'm not gonna do that. So we adapt in ways that we don't predict when we're younger that we might adapt. And then, as you point out, it's not clear how to extrapolate. If you check a box that says, I don't want to be intubated and I don't want CPR, well, what about dialysis? Or what about antibiotics or transfusions or something like that? You just po can't possibly imagine, as you point out, Ben, all the permutations of things that may go wrong. So let's see what we got. You, that's for you, Ben. This is a, this is a great question, and we, we did this live, and it was a little bit more uh, interactive. But we'll ask you at home to think about this and see where you fall. What are your concerns about treatment? Do you fall over to the, to the my left, which is five? I'm worried that I'll get overly aggressive care. Do you fall to the right, my right, which is I'm worried that I won't get enough care? Or do you fall in the middle? Um, ben, and what do you think people say around here? Well, <laughs> you know, I think when we did this last time, I think it was something like 85% <laughs> fell to the worry about overly aggressive care. And again, I'm going to just kind of reiterate this point because I want to be clear. That does not mean that there's not 10 to 15% that want, that are worried that they're not going to get enough care. And in fact, we were sharing stories when we were preparing for this about times where people um, got the impression of a healthcare provider that they were trying to steer them to a less aggressive course and how upset that can get, uh, make certain people in certain situations. And so that's, you know, that's a delicate situation. No one is trying to advocate, or at least we are not trying to advocate, that we convince people to choose one or the other. But um, it is interesting that while most people are worried about overly aggressive care, and I think when I show you what's in our chart, you might see that the way we default, generally speaking, is to do more care. Even though most people probably don't want that at certain stages in their lives, that is the default, generally speaking. Yeah, and I, um, although most of the people in Boulder, when we ask this question, are on the five end of a spectrum like this. I, in, uh, in, at University Hospital in the ER in Metro Denver, find groups of people who are very worried that they are not gonna get enough care. Yeah. Somebody who's undocumented, somebody who doesn't have insurance or is an immigrant, they're very afraid. So when uh, we do the conversation starter kit, which is one of the tools you have for talking with your family and then with your uh, provider, um, we look at these several of these scales. How much in control do you want to be? Are you okay with being in the hospital or would you rather be at home? Those kinds of things, those are really interesting questions and people do very different things. Now in Boulder, almost everybody wants to be in control, let's face it. But, but people come all over the spectrum and that's really important and as you pointed out, at every poll that is done of the general public, 10 or 15% of people say, every day on earth is sacred. If I'm attached to ventilator, if I'm in the ICU, that's okay because that's important to me. And those people particularly, it's very important because it's a minority view, but certainly one that we respect. Um, and so it's important to articulate that to yeah, your so, agent. So, so if, if you happen to fall on that side, it, it's important for us to know that. Right. 
Interestingly enough, in um, uh, large numbers of surveys, um, people talk about not wanting to be a burden. I think you hear this, Ben, a fair amount. Yeah, quite a lot. And again, that, that's why I always sort of talk about, you know, one way to not be a burden is to be more clear <laughs> about yeah. what your wishes are. Um, yeah. And I, I think that's a, a fairly common concern is that um, I don't want my family to spend their lives, their life savings, their time taking care of me when my quality of life is, is, is not what is acceptable to me. Um, and um, it, again, not all, their loved ones don't always know that. And it's helpful for us to sort of have a better sense of what your goals are. Um, and uh, you know, we talked about control and, and maybe that is a bolder thing. I think it's a fairly <laughs> universal thing. Though. It's I a think, United States I think thing. Maybe. Yeah, maybe it's a US <laughs> thing. People like to have some control. And, and in fairness to, to that statement, in healthcare, we quickly take away your control. You know, we write orders, uh, people bring you medicines, they administer them through an IV, you don't always even know exactly what's happening. And you're so, sick, you're it, not at your best self yeah, anyway. You, you might be confused, you might be um, unable to, to, so control is a huge problem in healthcare, and I think people are just sort of grasping for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, it turns out that when you survey people, I had one lady say, when I said, what matters most to you? She said, I don't want my family fighting over me in, while I'm lying in bed there. And actually, for a lot of people, they say, I'd rather that my family came to closure and they had peace of mind than particularly what they decide. If they need to put me on a ventilator for a week because it will help them come together, that would be okay. Not, it's not so much the procedures, yes, no, it's having that family not have those burdens of being in dispute, and that can leave a legacy too that isn't very good. So we've talked a little about leeway already. This cartoon says it's a narrative I didn't intend. There's so many things that we don't intend, and we've already talked about the fact that it's very helpful to tell your surrogate, the person who's gonna speak for you, it's okay for you to decide um, based on the actual context, the facts of the situation that I find myself in. So um, that's an important thing in the course of your conversation. Ben? Um, and I, I think we, we've discussed this a little bit, how things often change as, as time goes on, your concept of what's tolerable changes, your current situation changes, um, what you find uh, compelling as far as joy in life changes. And so um, you, um, you need to kind of revisit this. I recommend you do that if you do an annual visit, uh, either a wellness visit or a physical, um, that you sort of make sure that your, your wishes are known at that time, um, and maybe in preparation for it, you talk to your family or at least after. Um, and, you know, obviously we don't know Oops. if you don't tell us. So we did want to talk, we didn't want to, you know, ignore the elephant in the room, <laughs> which is COVID-19. And, um, you know, I've been spending in my day job uh, at Boulder Community a lot of time uh, addressing um, our preparedness for COVID-19, our preparedness for future surges. Gene and I have done some work around what do we do if we run out of ventilators? How many ventilators can we expand to? And, um, you know, I, I will say just, you know, as an aside that I'm proud to say, I, I think we are in a very good place where we have plenty of ventilators. I think the chances of us running out of ventilators at Boulder Community is extremely low. And one of the reasons for that is because Gene and many other people at Boulder Community and, and really nationally are having more of these conversations. And so what we've seen at Boulder Community is um, uh, many people are choosing that they don't want to be on a ventilator and we're honoring their wishes. Uh, maybe many is not the right word. We haven't had that many, um, that many patients with COVID, but, but some are choosing that they would prefer not to be on a ventilator. And we are actually kind of doubling down on these conversations where we are just making sure that we should always have these conversations. But in this time where there's this you know, acute th you know, worry about ventilators and ICU beds, we're taking extra effort to make sure when people get admitted with pneumonia, any type of pneumonia, but particularly COVID, um, we're having these conversations early and often, and uh, we're engaging some real experts in our palliative care team and our hospital medicine team, and, um, and we're doing this, and we're doing this well. And you know, you see people 
with lots and lots of different responses to this COVID. I, I like the fact that it's triggering people to actually seriously reflect on what they want, how they want the arc of the end of their life to look, because this COVID may be, it may be that they don't want to spend the last week of their life in the ICU on a ventilator in isolation from their family. So I've seen people who say, my life has been great. I'm at the end of the arc of my life. I really want to stay home and be comfortable. I've seen people who say, well, no, I'll go to the hospital if they need to use some oxygen and support me for a few days. That's OK with me. There are even people who say, you know something? I, um, I like a go at the ventilator. You know, maybe I'll be a Boris Johnson. I'll go into the hospital for a couple of weeks and I'll come back out and be just as feisty as ever. Another interesting point about the COVID-19 is when, we, when it first came to the United States, there was this uh, innovate early, this put, put people on ventilators quickly before they get too ill. And, um, and that was sort of the practice. Well, that has shifted and maybe surprisingly, maybe not, depends on your perspective. Um, the mortality has gone down as we've put people on ventilators uh, less aggressively. So, um, you know, ventilators certainly have their place, but often, you know, it's, it, it's not always better to be on a ventilator. And then it's certainly not better to be on a ventilator if you don't want to be on a ventilator. And my thinking certainly changed from the early days when we thought there was a 90% mortality when you were on the ventilator over 65. Um, to, you know something, it's more like 20 or 30% right now, and who knows how it's gonna change. We're, we're talking today. <laughs> and I, I think that's a really good point that people maybe, I, I just was at a presentation from the, from the state health department where they cited a 50% mortality, and all of us in the room were like, what, that, it's not 50%, it's, you know, it's more like you know, 20, 30, depending on uh, the situation. But it, um, so I think the mortality rate has really, um, we're starting to recognize that it's not as high as we initially thought. Ben, there was a very interesting essay um, by um, a lady uh, a couple of weeks ago in some of the national papers who had cancer. And um, she was in the middle of like about a third round of chemotherapy, but she was living a good quality life. And about six months ago, she had signed DNR paperwork because she realized that this cancer would eventually do her in. And at the time when her heart stopped, she wouldn't want an attempt at CPR. But she started to rethink that, and she actually rescinded her DNR because she said, wait a minute, my doc thinks that I have a year, two years still to go, um, that I'm fighting this cancer just fine, and I don't want no care, which is not what DNR means, but she said, you know, I want to rescind that DNR. I want a good try with, if I get COVID. So people cut differently. This is a real time of reflection, I think, for lots of people. And I, right. the other important point that Gene brought up is you can change. If you, if you, you know, decide you want to be in DNR and then you say, well, I don't really want to be DNR, you can change it as long as you, you know, document that and tell people about that. If you have an MDPOA and it's your brother and then you decide you don't want it to be your brother, you can change it. Uh, these things are fluid. They're not forever. All right. Nuts and bolts, Ben. Yeah, so, so this is, you know, <laughs> how do you talk about it? I, I think that um, uh, it, it's, it's fairly simple. Just bring it up, you know, hey, I, I want to talk about advanced care planning. I want to talk about uh, my goals at the end of life. And, um, and talk to your doctor about what's important to you. I think that's really the first step. And start thinking about who your medical power of attorney would be and then document that. And then um, I think a key point, sometimes people worry that they're going to upset their doctor by asking questions that maybe take time and things like that. And I, I want to reassure you, um, if it's simple and you know exactly what you want and you've already thought it through, then, you know, bring it up at your routine appointment when you have a bunch of other issues. And it's, it's generally not a big, issue, a big problem. But if, if you have a lot of questions and you really want to explore it, we are happy to do a separate appointment. You know, we can get paid for it. We are happy to do it. We have time. We can have help. We have social workers. We have nurses that can help us with that. We've trained the team to discuss this collaboratively. And um, we do have the time. Sometimes we have to make the time. And sometimes it might be, let's come back next week. Why don't you start thinking about it? Here's some forms. Come on back. But um, I, I don't want people to think that we don't have the time or that this is too much pressure. 
Um, we want to have these conversations. Um, and I actually think that one of the nice things that sometimes happens in the medical office doesn't necessarily have to be the provider, but trying to figure out how to talk to your family, which can be sort of hard. And sometimes it's a matter of you saying, let's make another appointment, and why don't you bring your fill in the blank with you and we can talk about it together? Because sometimes having that extra person makes it a little easier to bring up this topic. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. I think we've discussed this, but I, let's go to this the next is, one. Um, I'm gonna, oh, sorry. Was, I'm going to skip yeah. that one, too. Let's talk about BCH's role here. Yeah, and so then open I, I want to go to the, the EMR um, slide, which I think is next. Okay, I'm going to say one point about this, which is when I teach um, docs, which I do down at the medical school and do with palliative care, one of my favorite things to teach them to ask in the doctor's office is, what do I need to know about you as a person to give you the best care possible? That may be the sort of big picture archy thing that sometimes you ask and sometimes the patient needs to nudge the doc. It works both ways. It's a dialogue. Some of this is very grassrootsy when you think about it. The idea of let's have a conversation about how much care or what level of care do I want. Depends on your doc. You obviously are comfortable with having these kinds of conversations. Some people aren't quite as much. But let's look at how it gets documented these days, because you guys have made impressive steps in the last yeah, year. Yeah, I think when we gave this conversation, we had this uh, topic a few years ago. We had a different medical record system, and we were anticipating this change. So now we have the, the sort of premier medical record system in the country, which um, is the same system that all of the hospital systems uh, in Colorado, I think, have now, I at least so. all of the big systems. Yeah. And so there is communication between these systems, which is great. Because when you, uh, I'm going to borrow that. Thanks, yep. Um, so you can see we blurred out. <laughs> there you are. Okay, so we blurred out the the you know the demographic, the patient's picture and the name. So let's say that's Ben Kaiden. That's my beautiful face. That's my name and date of birth. And so you can see right. This is the first uh, picture that I get when I open up a chart of a patient. And right here is this code. And you can see this, they just took a screenshot for me of a, of a, a random person that, did, um, that had never addressed it. And my point is, if you do not address it, this is what it will say. Assume full code, no advanced care planning documents. Which I find kind of a little interesting that that's how we default. And then, you know, you can, you can pull in there and you can add some stuff here. A living will, uh, assume full code. Um, and then, when you go to the hospital or you go see a specialist, um, they can see this, and in fact, it's, it's available. What's nice about it is for me in the ER, if I'm seeing a patient in the ER who I don't know, that same screen comes up in the ER. Yeah, I mean, I like that this could save all of us, including our patients, a little time and headaches to have to keep going through these conversations that are not easy conversations. And then this is just a little bit more advanced. You know, you can see a little bit more detail about the conversation, the code status, and so we have all of these um, ways to document. This is new, and at this point, we're actually trying to reach out to patients to ask them about this and to try to get this documented so that we can um, have a better idea of what is important to you. Um, so this is a big change in the last year since we went to our um, new EMR. And um, you know, I think we're, we're wrapping it up, so we have t time for questions. This is our homework. This is your homework, all right? You need to think about what matters to you. We want to nudge you to not only think about it, but talk about it with those you love, and then document it. And then once you've had chosen your agent and thought about this, bring it into your physician, your primary care provider, and so that we can document it in the chart, which is now much more transparent than it was even a year ago. So, and at bch.org, you can look and get materials and some guidance as to how to do it. There are tools there. The Conversation Project Starter Kit is there. Um, others, links, so that you can start this process on your own, and then you can ask for help because um, the offices are open to having these conversations. And so we put a, a, a sort of generic, you can look at bch.org, you can search advanced care planning, you'll find it. Uh, I think Amy is going to put a link that you can just click on, but it's a little hard in a virtual a lecture. And also, I think you could honestly Google advanced care planning, medical power of attorney, and you could find these documents as well. 
But uh, again, we recommend that you start with a medical power of attorney or an MDPOA. That's the one that the link is for. The other documents are there as well, and if you want to talk more about them, we, we are absolutely willing to do that and happy to. Here's some more resources we have. Um, and I don't know, Gene, if you want to talk about that video, I'm not familiar oh, with there, If you're having trouble figuring out who you should make your proxy, your MDPOA, there's just a very acute video that's about two and a half minutes long about all the people that you don't want to be making decisions for you, the ones who know everything, the ones who aren't curious about you, the ones who are off sailing or trekking in Peru, that kind of thing. It's just a fun thing that you might enjoy and might give you a laugh because one of the best ways of sort of talking to your uh, family is to make it fun. I mean, it's hard to conceive of this as fun, but it can be fun. It's a good way to get to know each other better. <laughs> That's um, it. So I think we're going to try to have uh, time for questions, and um, I'm, I'm hoping that there's some questions in the chat box. Yes, we do have a few questions. And let's see, question number one is, um, we've covered where to get the forms. Sorry, we've covered where a person can grab these forms, and I've posted it here on the chat. Um, a, a viewer wants to know how to get them legalized. Like, what's the legal process to like make sure that they're actually legal? So, this is the Colorado Hospital Association form. Okay. The MDPOA. It's nice to have witnesses. It's you can get it notarized, but none of that is required for okay. any of these. Um, what you do have to do is make them available to your provider, to your family members. And mm -hmm. people recommend that you notarize them if you're going to be traveling out of state a lot, just to make darn sure that people understand them and recognize them. But you fill these out yourself. Does insurance cover advanced care planning? Yeah, that's a great question because I think, again, people worry about you know, being a burden to their doctor and taking too much time. And there is a code, a billing code for this now. I think it's, I don't know how long it's been, but it's been a while. And we can bill for it. We can bill for it um, on repeat occasions. We can bill for time, including uh, the healthcare team, such as a social worker or a um, uh, nurse. and. Um, you can bill for it for a specific visit only for this, or you can take uh, uh, roll it into a visit if that's appropriate. And that's where sometimes there's not always time for that, but if there is, then you can do it in, during an, an, any other routine visit. And the other thing is, say that you are speaking for somebody else who can't speak for themselves, you can see their doctor and they can make an appointment and chat with you. They also can bill for that. And that's a really important thing for if you're taking care of a mother with dementia or a, somebody else who can't talk for themselves. I'm going to go ahead and ask this because we're getting this question fairly regularly, repeatedly now. And that is, um, I've talked to my PG. She is too religious and thus will not... Um, assist in medical aid in dying. This particular viewer is terminally ill. What should I do as I understand it takes two physicians to okay such decision? Yeah, that's, that's a tough question. Uh, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad that someone asked that. I think, um, generally speaking, I would ask your physician to refer you to someone that does do that, and if they are unable, or you know, they might not know who does it. Uh, I think that it's not always like you know deceptive. They just might. It's hard to know this stuff. But um, BCH has providers that do that, and you could establish with the provider at BCH and ask them. Not all of our providers do it. Some of us uh, do it. Some do not. We allow our providers to make that decision in accordance with the law and their personal values. And um, uh, but we do have providers that will do it. And either that provider who might not be comfortable, they, they still might be comfortable being that second provider who just has to be a consultant that certifies that you do have a terminal illness in less than six months to live. And if they're not comfortable with that, we can also arrange for that too. What do you recommend to a person who does not have family or friends 
that they'd like to be their want. power of attorney? Like, who would you recommend? That, that has become actually, and is going to continue to be, an increasing problem. Um, you've outlived all of your family, you don't have family, um, and so a couple of solutions to that. One is there are people who provide the service of being the MDPOA. It costs some money, but they're actually very skilled because they do know how to ask those questions, what matters to you, what would you want in certain situations, et cetera, and they will speak in your voice, and so they can be designated and hired. The other thing I think some people have done in, informally, either in their place of residence or within a faith community or something like that, is buddy up with somebody else who's also solo, and they agree to speak for each other. Okay, thank you. Do HIPAA laws pose problems when dealing with these end-of-life issues for the medical power of attorney? Was that HIPAA? HIPAA, HIPAA laws. Uh, not no. that I'm aware of, no. Okay. <laughs> There, the HIPAA laws um, are meant to prevent the sharing of information with people who aren't authorized. They're also sometimes used excessively as a way of not divulging information. But when you're the MDPOA, you end up being the voice of the patient. And you speak as the patient, you make decisions, informed consent uh, for surgery. So you are the patient. How does BCH formally interface with the Colorado End of Life Options Act and patients' rights under it? Uh, meaning, how does BCH interface with a hospital, as a, you know, hospitalized patient? Is that the medical aid and dying? Oh, that's, uh, with medical aid and dying. Yeah. So, BCH, yeah. so um, I think there's maybe two parts to that question. Um, we do not provide medical aid and dying in the hospital. Uh, Nobody does. At which yeah. I don't think it's, uh, I'm not sure if it's allowed, but it's not, um, not done. Um, but we do certainly do palliative care and we'll arrange for hospice and we'll discharge people for hospice. Um, we do uh, offer or allow our physicians to provide medical aid in dying in the uh, ambulatory or the outpatient setting in the clinic um, if they choose to. And I think we have, you know, 10 or so that have decided that they are um, willing to perform that service. And, um, and you, there are some minor restrictions, like you cannot take the medication on our premises. It's meant to be taken at home. And we, we follow the law, which has other restrictions, like it's not allowed in dementia. You have to have a terminal illness. It has to be certified by another doctor that you have less than six months to live. You can't be severely depressed or otherwise not of sound mind. Um, and. Um, you have to be able to administer the medication yourself. And you have to have decisional capacity up to and including the time when you um, administer the medication yourself. And usually hospitalized patients are not at, at their best in terms of decisional capacity. So it's something that's far more common in an outpatient setting. But institutions in Colorado, although there's some interesting lawsuits about it, are not allowed to ban um, their providers from uh, offering them if the provider feels in good conscience they can do it. And uh, Boulder Community was one of the first systems to say, yes, we will opt in for this in terms of a, not impairing our providers or prohibiting them from participating in this on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And we also set up a pretty good training, I think, that was, you know, not sure, Gene, were you, you involved in that? But I was involved in that a little bit, and it's one of the best in the state yeah. in terms of helping physicians. This is, a, this is a tough procedure. It's a high risk in a way. You're, you're contributing to somebody's death, and it's a low frequency kind of thing. It turns out that 0.4% that, uh, of patients actually end their life with medical assisted dying. Um, we think about it a lot more. Yeah, this goes back to that control piece. My, <laughs> yes. my experience is that people um, seem extremely grateful to have a little bite of control at the very end of life, and then many of them don't exercise that control. Well, maybe they do, just, they just have that control. That in itself is an exercise, but they don't always take it, as Gene says. In fact, they often do not. They die of 
whatever natural disease they had. And it turns out that when they get hooked up with palliative care and hospice, the end of life can be a lot more gentle than people's imaginations. And but that, that so said, some people choose to take it for a variety of reasons, and you know, and, and that is uh, people's personal decision. Yeah. We have a viewer that would like for you guys to speak a little bit more around the um, pitfalls of a living will. What, what problems that can, you can run so into there? The living will, if you pull out the, the form that's part of the Colorado Hospital Association, um, kicks in in two particular situations. One is if you are terminally ill which is undefined and which everybody sort of defines in a different way. I talked to a lawyer once and asked him what he thought terminal was, and he said, well, that's if you have a cancer diagnosis. And I thought, Christopher Columbus, that's not what I call terminal. And I said, if, if that's the case, then I guess we're all terminal. So, um, yeah. and the other instance that the living will kicks in is if you're in uh, a persistent vegetative state, which is a neurologic term, which I understand from my neurologist is pretty much obsolete these days because we've learned so much more about the brain and about um, states of unconsciousness. So I don't find it very useful. It's so rarely applicable. It, you're not in that s situation if you have a really bad stroke if you have very bad heart failure, if you have kidney failure, or even if you're on a ventilator from respiratory failure, those aren't terminal states per se. But what the living will does do, and the reason it's, it's an okay thing to look at is that it pra helps you practice the conversation. What are, what are the lines below which I don't think life would be worth living? So. A viewer asked, how many MPOAs are practical? How um, many? I, I didn't catch the question. How, how many, many MPOAs is practical? Oh, You mean having more than one, I guess, is yeah. what the, Right, you need um, a couple of backups. Yeah, but uh, I, I wonder if the question is referring to, is it better to have like your two, two children or to pick one? And I guess the answer, maybe Gene, you probably have more experience with this. It might be, it depends. I mean, if your siblings get along really well and they understand what you want, and um, then that might be okay to have two. I generally prefer it if it's one because you don't get into these conflicts. Yeah. Um, but, you know. That's, I agree with that. You pick one and you should have a couple of backups. Um, <clears throat> particularly in a time of COVID, if you are an elderly person and your spouse is also elderly, the chances that you get it together are not all that far-fetched. And so picking somebody of a different generation, and um, you, you should put them in rank order, but you should tell them also that you're doing that. So my son, who is third on the list, I have said to him, I love you, so much that I know this would be stressful to you. And um, I, so your sister is going to be the one who's next in line, but you're gonna be needed to support her. And I need to tell you what's important to me just as much as I tell her. Because even though we want one person, most of us live in families, communities, and those decisions are not necessarily individualistic ones as much as we need in medicine. ask in a time pinch, would a phone conversation with an overseas child suffice? I would think so, yes. And I'll tell you that one of the silver linings of the COVID epidemic is that Medicare and Medicaid and other insurers are loosening the rules in terms of what counts as a conversation about end of life care or assignment of an MDPOA, and that can be done with telehealth, and actually can be done not visually, but even with a phone call now. And certainly it's far more common to need to do that in a time when we don't move around and your daughter may be in New York State, can't come to see you near the end of your life. And so that whole telehealth thing, palliative care is so ramped up and doing such an awesome job of getting permissions, of talking about goals of care with people remotely. 
That's yeah, and I'm not aware of any restrictions on if your MDPOA happens to live out of the country, um, you can still use them. We would still use them, assuming they're available, and you can, you know, have a conversation. And it's documented. There's no restrictions on they have to live in the same state or the same country. Well, it's just about eight o'clock now, so I'm going to go ahead and do the closing. And is there anything else, y'all? Well, thank you all. You've been a wonderful audience. <laughs> yeah. We'll right. applaud you as you applaud them. us. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anything else you guys want to say before we close? I thank you for the chance to address this. Ben, I appreciate working with you. It's always been fun. And uh, BCH is doing a great job. And um, I think the COVID epidemic has just triggered us all to be a little more um, compelling and compelled to think about these kinds of things. And I'll just thank Jean, who volunteers her time, and I'm going to clap for her. Oh, and, and really an expert in this, as you, as you have witnessed. And so I am very lucky to have her as a uh, mentor and teacher. That's great. That's great. Well, uh, to our participants, thank you for joining us tonight. A recording of tonight's lecture will be available at bch.org backslash live stream in a couple of days. Tomorrow, you will receive an email uh, which will have a survey of tonight's lecture. Uh, we ask that you do please take a moment to fill that out. And thanks again and have a good night.